Hello and welcome back to our series on electrical and computer engineering. Tonight we close a cycle that we began almost two years ago when the very first episode of this series was broadcast for the first time. That night I told you we would begin our journey through the land of electrical engineering by learning the language spoken in that land. ECT, remember, electric circuits theory. And I said also that that language has very few words in its vocabulary and we have seen many of those words. We have seen words like charge and current, voltage, node, binary node, reference node, super node, branch, resistor, inductor, capacitor, series, parallel connections. But we also said that the language ECT has very few grammar rules. It has only three. And we have already seen the first of the three grammar rules. Guess which one that is. You got it right. Ohm's law. That is the first grammar rule of ECT. In a resistor, the voltage across the resistor is proportional to the current flowing through the resistor. Tonight, we present the other two grammar rules. We will call them in our class the K laws. <laughs> no, not K less. K laws. After the German physicist of the 19th century, Gustav Robert Kirchhoff, who discovered them. Those are known in science and engineering as the Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, and Kirchhoff's voltage law, KVL. In our class, I'll make reference to them very often simply as KCL and KVL. Let's begin. I expect that every viewer at the end of the video should be able to use a Gauss surface as a super node, define the general version of the KCL, explain how the general version of KCL can be applied to any node, even to a binary node, and to define what is a loop, what is a window pane loop, and describe both in words and in equations what is the KVL. Let's begin. Kirchhoff's current law, KCL take one. Back in high school, we were exposed to KCL this way. All the current that arrives at a node leaves that node, and that was fine. Which can also be stated as the total current arriving in a node is equal to the total current leaving that node. In math code, this is what we write. All the currents entering one node is equal to the total current leaving that one node. But why? That's because two premises in modeling the electric phenomenon has been in place for electric and electronic circuits. Those are first, that electricity, or electric charge if you want to be more formal, behaves as an incompressible fluid. If you don't remember, please go back to the second video of this series where we had a conversation on why we do that. Second premise, that that incompressible fluid, that is electricity, electric charge, fills up every cubic millimeter of every wire, every resistor, every capacitor, source, etc. in the circuit. There is no room for more. A sensible consequence of that is that when we squeeze in so many coulombs per second into a node, of course, because that node's already full, we charge the same amount of coulombs per second will be escaping the node through one or more of the other wires connected to the node. That makes sense. Imagine the current entering that node through this uh, branch on the right is 2 amps, and this is 5 amps, and 3 amps are leaving, and 9 amps are entering the node 6 this way, and 1 amp is leaving, and 6 amps are leaving through the resistor V. Fine. The question is, if KVL is true, what is the current X leaving node 6 through the resistor S? Can you tell me? Sure, we apply KCL to node 6 and write that all the currents entering node 6 are equal to the sum of all the currents leaving node 6. Of course, you could write the currents leaving the node as negative currents and write the equation this way. Instead, however, I strongly advise you not 
to do that. Why? Is that wrong? No, it is not wrong. But in my experience in front of a class, I have seen many a top student make a sign mistake when writing the KCL equation that way and losing big time marks in the final exam. I don't want that to happen. So please write the equation as above where all currents appear as positive numbers and there is less of a chance of you making a mistake in the final exam. Now let's write that equation. Currents entering in that note 6 are 2, 5, and 9. Check them out. 2, 5, and 9 enter the node 6, and currents leaving the node are 4, 3, x, 1, and 6. If that is the KCL equation, from there we have only one unknown and we solve for it, and the current text flowing through resistor S is 6 amperes. Piece of cake. Now let's have a look at a general form of KCL. You see, if every part of the circuit is completely full with an incompressible fluid that is electric charge, then we can apply KCL not only to a node, but to a whole region as a part of any circuit. Let's take this part of the circuit surrounded by that blue boundary. We can say that all the current entering that boundary is equal to the sum of all the currents leaving that boundary, right? Let's take that this current leaving through this uh, branch at the bottom is 6 amps and we have 2 amps entering and 6 amps entering the boundary, 2 amps entering the boundary, 1 amp leaving the boundary and an unknown number of amperes x leaving the boundary at the top. Because that area inside the boundary is assumed to be full with the incompressible fluid that is electricity, we know that KCL must apply to the entire boundary. We write the sum of all the currents entering the boundary must be equal to the sum of all the currents leaving the boundary. Again, don't write it like that, right? The sum of all the currents entering the boundary is 2, 6, and 2, and leaving x, 1, and 6. Solve for x, and the current x is 3 amperes. Piece of cake. When we can draw a circuit in such a way that no wires cross one another, we say the circuit is planar. And that is an important definition. However, VLSI circuit chips very often are not planar. Those are three dimensional circuits that cannot be drawn on a plane without having branches crossing one another, right? In a non-planar circuit, the boundary becomes a 3D closed surface that encloses a part of the circuit, a Gauss surface, a Gaussian surface, a GS. But we still can write around that Gaussian surface KCL this way. A Gauss surface, I repeat, is a 3D closed surface that encloses part of a circuit. By its definition, it cuts one or more wires. So KCL becomes all the current entering a Gauss surface is equal to all the currents leaving the Gauss surface, right? The sum of all the currents arriving in the Gauss surface is equal to the sum of all the currents leaving the Gauss surface. In math, we write this is equal to that. Another numerical exercise. What current leaves a subcircuit through that branch on the top left? You say, well, all I have to do is enclose this subcircuit by a boundary, a Gauss surface like this, and apply KCL. And you say currents entering that Gauss surface, 10 and 3, currents leaving the Gauss surface, 2, 7, and the unknown. And from that, we can solve for x and x is 4 amperes. Very often, a Gauss surface can be considered sort of a super node. I repeat, a Gauss surface is a closed 3D surface. We only trace the intersection of that 3D imaginary surface with a plane where we have drawn the circuit. That is that blue trace that is there.
Time to work with numbers. Tutorial time one. In that circuit, wait for independent voltage sources and for independent current sources. We want to find what is one particular current. Find what is the current in red using KCL only once. What current in red? This current in red. X, the current in that V source. We know that there is no way of predicting what is going to be the current in a V source before we solve the circuit. Our first task is finding a Gauss surface, a boundary that first has to cross that current X so that X appears in the KCL equation and such a surface that every other branch that it crosses has a known current. Let's see. Does this Gauss surface work? Hmm, it certainly crosses the unknown current and the 9 amps uh, current. Unfortunately, it also crosses a 2 volt source current that is unknown. So KCL would have two unknowns. We would not be able to solve for both of them. And remember, we can use KCL only once. How about this other Gauss surface? Let's see. First condition, it crosses the branch where we want to compute the current X. That is fine. And we know that uh, this current is 8 amps and this current uh, is 6 amps. Um, but we don't know what is this current here, right? So we have two unknowns in one equation. So that Gauss surface will not work for us. We can use KCL only once. That is a condition of this exercise. Let's try a third time. Third time is a charm. How about this Gauss surface? Let's see. It crosses the branch with the unknown current. First condition. Second, we know every other current that is crossing that boundary. And we know that this current is 9 amps leaving the boundary, 7 amps entering the Gauss surface, 6 amps leaving the Gauss surface, and that is all. We can write a KCL equation for that Gauss surface like this, right? Not like that, like this. Currents entering the Gauss surface, x plus 7. Currents leaving the Gauss surface, 9 plus 6. Solve for x. That current is 8 amperes, right there on the top. By the way, that current is flowing downhill through that 3 volt source. What is the power in that source? Well, voltage times current. We already have the video on electric power. That power in that source is 3 volts times 8 amps, 24 watts absorbed power. That source absorbing 24 watts. Why do you say absorbing? If you don't remember this, watch again the video on electric power. We could have solved the same exercise in a much longer way using KCL three times the first time for this Gauss surface and find this current in the 5 volt source and then use KCL again for this other Gauss surface too to find this other current and finally use KCL for this Gauss surface three and find the current text that we need. We are using KCL three times, but remember, by doing that, we are multiplying by three the possibilities of us making a mistake. It's better to use KCL only once if we can. Tutorial time two. This circuit appeared in a modified form in a book called the Shaum's Outlines on Electric Circuits by the late Professor Joseph Edminster. And that was more than 40 years ago. The question was, what is the current flowing through the branch between nodes 3 and 5? And second part of the question, what is the voltage between nodes 1 and 8? That is, how much higher node 1 is than node 8? Let's begin. I will apply KCL to node 3. But for that, because we need to compute this blue current, I need also the other two currents entering or leaving node 3, this current and that current. Because those two yellow currents are in the same branch, those two currents have the same value, A. So when we use this Gauss surface and write a KCL for it, we say currents arriving in the Gauss surface, A. Currents leaving the Gauss surface, A plus X. That is our KCL equation and from that we solve X and X is zero. That is, there is no current 
through the link branch between 3 and 5. There is a consequence to that because that branch has one resistor and the voltage in a resistor is given by Ohm's law. The voltage in that resistor is R times I and I is zero, the voltage is zero. So that means that 3 and 5 are at the very same electric height. Then to find how much higher 1 is than 8, allow me to start climbing up from 8 and say from 8 to 5 I actually climb negative 10 volts and then from 5 to 3 0 volts and from 3 to 1 I climb up 2 volts. So the total climb is negative 8 volts. 1 is higher than node 8 by negative 8 volts. So that means in reality 1 is lower than 8 by 8 volts. I could have solved this circuit in a different way, observe. We need to find that current, right? How about if I use this Gauss surface instead? Currents entering that Gauss surface, look at it, zero. Currents leaving the unknown current, right? Zero is x, so that means that the current in that branch is zero, and there is no current in the link, and the same is true for the rest of the solution. Our third tutorial time for this lecture is rather a demonstration of something that we said a while ago in the video on topology and electric circuits. We said in that lecture without proof that if two elements are in series, they share the same current. We need to prove that. And we will prove that using KCL. If two elements are in series, they are in the same branch. That is what we said in that video. Let's prove that all the elements in the same branch share the same current then we will have proven uh, that all the elements in series have the same current. Let's do it this way. There is a branch and we apply KCL to that Gauss surface 1. That proves that the current entering and leaving any one element have to be the same. This is no trivial finding. And then we go ahead and we apply KCL to this other larger Gauss surface and we say, well, the current in two consecutive elements in a branch have the same current. Fine. And then we apply that a third time and we say the current entering uh, any element and leaving any other element is the same, which proves what we wanted to prove, that the current in any two elements in series is the same. Let's go now for the second K law, KVL. The same way that we had to make a definition that of a Gauss surface before tackling the general form of the first K law, KCL, before we face the second K law, KVL, we also need to make a few definitions. What is a loop? What is a window pane loop? Let's begin. What is a loop? Well, in topology in mathematics, a loop is a path whose initial point is equal to the terminal point. But in electric circuit theory, a loop is a closed trajectory in the circuit that does not cross any node but once. And we need to define what I mean by crossing a node. To cross a node means to arrive in the node and then leave out of the node. A window pane loop does not contain any other loops inside. By the way, another name for a window pane loop is mesh. That is a loop. That trajectory crosses every node only once. This is also a loop. But this is not a loop. Why not? Because that trajectory is crossing the blue node not once, but twice. That's why that is not a loop. How about this one? That is a loop. But this is not a loop. Why? Because it's crossing the same node twice. Finally, these are window pane loops, WPLs. This one. It is a loop that contains no smaller loops inside. This is also a window pane loop, and so is this one. My question to you, how many window pane loops you identify in the circuit? Pause the video, count them, and compare that answer with what I'm about to tell you. You got it? Fine. You have how many? Ten window pane loops. That's right. That is right. 
Let me define once again what is a planar network. A planar circuit or network is one that can be drawn on a piece of paper or on the screen of a computer without any wire crossing another and without any branch crossing another branch. In planar networks, it is very easy to identify the window pane loops as we have done a moment ago. However, there are many interesting and important circuits in our technology that are not planar. And in those non-planar networks, it is not that trivial to identify the window pane loops as we shall see. The following circuit it is not a real-world circuit, but it serves to show how much more challenging it is to identify window pane loops in a 3D non-planar network. There you go. That circuit can be discretized as uh, two square-based pyramids joined by the base 3, 4, 5, 6. The question is, how many window pane loops can you identify in this non-planar network? It's evident it's non-planar, right? Now you tell me. Immediately you say, well, this is a loop, and this is a loop of the same family, and there are eight of those loops. Yes, what else? Well, there is another group of four loops like this one, so we have 8 and 4, we have 12 window pane loops all counted. Oh, that wasn't that bad, was it? However, allow me to add two more branches. One resistor between the node 1 at the top and node 7 at the center, and another resistor yet between the node 7 at the center and the node 2 at the very bottom. How many window pane loops do you see now? Not that easy anymore. What is worse? Now there are window pane loops that would be irrelevant and redundant in an analysis of the circuit when we get to solving a circuit using loops, which is something I do not recommend. But anyway, it's time for the second law of Kirchhoff, the KVL, the Kirchhoff's voltage law. When we travel along an element, we jump across an element following the circuit. The voltage either goes up and then we have a climb, or the voltage goes down and then we have a drop across the element. Well, in a loop, says KVL, the sum of all the climbs is equal to the sum of all the drops. Or, if we describe drops as negative voltages, we say in a loop, the sum of all the climbs is zero. Of course, counting a drop as a negative climb. Using mathematical notation, we can write the sum in the loop of all the climbs is equal to the sum in the loop of all the drops. Sure, but uh, why? Why is that so? Before answering that question, let me bring back one definition we introduced several videos ago, voltage reference. The same way as we defined heights in terrains or the height of an airplane as the difference in height between that airplane or that city and the reference level for heights, the voltage of any node is given as the difference in voltage between that node and a reference node that we have previously chosen. Now let's say about the reference node that it's chosen in a semi-arbitrary way and that once we choose it, we keep it. Even a humble binary node could be the reference node. How? By promotion. If you don't really know what I'm saying here, go back to the video on topology. In this circuit, you immediately see four nodes and you can choose this one as the reference and then identify the other nodes as nodes 1, 2 and 3. 
but we could also have chosen the note on the right as the reference and then have notes one two and three for the other ones or even the one in the center could be the reference and the others would have names one two and three one more thing even a binary node could be chosen as a reference it is promoted this is my reference now it's a node i have to pay attention to and i have nodes one two three and four this binary node has been promoted to true node, right? Uh, but then we have more nodes to keep track of, and as we shall see in the future, we have more equations. So when we promote a binary node to the state of true node, we are adding in the future one more node to look after and one more equation to solve for. Now about voltages of nodes, and the reference node. As we said before, the voltage of any node, let's say node 1, V1, tells us how much higher in volts that node is than the reference that we chose, the chosen reference node. By definition, the voltage of the reference would be how much higher the reference is than the reference, of course. How much is that? Zero. By definition, the voltage of the reference node is zero volts. The voltage of any node below the reference is negative, which is a convention, of course. Now we move towards the justification of Kirchhoff's voltage law. But instead of working inside the electric field, inside an electronic circuit, allow me to work inside the gravitational field in this beautiful landscape of Lake Moraine in Alberta, Canada. And I will be talking about heights instead of voltages, but the same applies. And instead of having a reference node, I have a reference height. And guess what's going to be my reference height here? The surface of the lake, of course. Take point A on a branch in that tree on the far side of the lake. There is an eagle perched on a branch at that point A. That point A is 30 meters above the reference level, above the lake surface. Now, that eagle looks at the tree near me to that branch that is 80 meters above the lake surface. The height of B now is 80. What is the climb from A to B? And you say, well, height of the destination, 80, minus height of the origin of the trajectory, 30, that is 50 meters. So the eagle flies, climbing up 50 meters from A to B. From B, it spies the fish near the shore on the far side of the lake and swoops down 80 meters. After that, realizes that it could have a much better view of fish and rodents from the top of that mountain so it climbs up at high speed 200 meters to reach point D. My question to you is how much higher D is than A? Immediately you say well I'm going to add and subtract all climbs and all drops. I say plus 50 because I'm going up from A to B, minus 80 going down to C, plus 200 going to D. And that sum will give me how much higher D is than A, the destination D, than the origin of the trajectory A. Add all of that. D is higher than A by 50, minus 80, plus 200, 170 meters. Observe how I find the difference in height between an origin of a trajectory and any destination, right? Just add all climbs and subtract all drops. If that is so, imagine that the eagle climbs down by 20 meters to pointy and then descends back to the same branch where it began. What is the difference in height between A and A? Zero. But that difference in height can be calculated by the same procedure as before. 
add 50, subtract 80, etc., etc. When you arrive back at A, the sum is the difference in height between A and itself, and it has to be zero. What is the conclusion? In a closed trajectory inside a gravitational field, if we add all climbs and subtract all drops, we get zero. Why is that? Because the gravitational field is a conservative field. Guess which field is also conservative? Oh, you got it right. The electric field inside an electronic circuit. So that's why we can do this inside an electric circuit around any loop, which is a closed trajectory inside an electric circuit, inside an electric field. The sum of all voltage drops, positive and negative ones, is zero, right? In math terms, we say around a loop, the sum of all voltages, positive and negative ones, is zero but remember we have to take their signs into account personally i prefer to count climbs up on one side and drops on the other side that way all voltages are positive and i say the sum of all the climbs in a loop are equal to the sum of all the drops in the loop let's have a numerical example Tutorial time number four. For that 7-amp independent current source, I ask you, what is the voltage in it? This X voltage. And of course, your answer has to be, I don't know. Remember the video on circuit elements, right? I do not know what is that voltage. I need to compute it. And to compute it, I'm going to use KVL. But I want you to use KVL only once to find that one. So we need um, a trajectory, a loop that crosses that element so that voltage X is in the equation, right? But I need to make sure that that loop does not cross any other element for which I do not know the voltage because I would have more than one unknown in that equation. Let's try this. This loop, does it work? You say, well, it has the voltage X in the loop, but it has also the unknown voltage on the 9 amp current source in the middle. So no, a KVL equation for that loop would have two unknowns. One equation, two unknowns, not good. How about this other loop? Well, that loop also has the voltage X inside the equation, so I have X as an unknown in a KVL equation that I might write for the loop. But again, I have another unknown, which is the voltage in the 8 amp current source. I don't know that voltage either. So I would have one KVL equation and two unknowns, X and the voltage in the 8 amp independent current source. Let's find one loop that crosses that 7 amp source but where all the other elements have voltages that we already know. How about this one? That seems to work. Check it out. It crosses X and the rest of the voltages 2, 3, 4, 5 volts. Let's write a KVL equation for that loop, which will be our first KVL equation. I start anywhere on that trajectory and I choose to walk the trajectory either clockwise or counterclockwise. I always prefer to be consistent and walk my loops in a clockwise direction. Let me start at this point here, right below the 2 volt source and start climbing up by 2 and then climbing down by 3, climbing down by 4 climbing up by 5 and climbing up by x. That is a KVL equation, right? That has to be equal to 0. And from there, I can solve for x, the voltage in the 7 amps independent current source. You say, what if I choose to travel that trajectory, that loop, in the opposite direction, counterclockwise, starting at the same point, you say, no big deal. Then I start here and I go down by X, 
down by 5, up by 4, up by 3, and down by 2. And that has to be equal to 0. So you see, it is the very same equation, but multiplied by negative 1. It's the same equation, right? No difference. Of course, you're going to get the same, the same solution. What if you choose to write a KVL equation writing the climbs on one side and the drops on the other side? Well, in that case, what we get is the two climbs, 3 and 4, on the left, and all the drops, 2, 5, and x on the right-hand side. When you solve either of those equations, you get the answer is 0. The voltage in that 7 amps independent current source is 0 volts, and this is quite a coincidence. It is not a general result, eh? The power in the source, of course, is voltage times current, and because the voltage is 0, 7 times 0 is 0 watts. Tutorial time number 5. Let's do the same for the voltage x in the 6 amps current source. I know what you're thinking. Why did you specify the unknown voltage x, predicting that the top is going to be higher than the bottom? I don't know. I just chose one direction. And when I solve for x, I may get a positive a value or a negative one. After watching the video on polarities and the negative sign in this series, you know that it's unimportant to worry about that as long as we're consistent in the way we use signs and we draw the polarities of voltage. How about this loop? That would be the loop that in only one KVL equation would give us the value of x. This is our second KVL equation for this lecture. Let me start at the same point, at the bottom of the 2 volts voltage source, and start climbing up by 2, climbing down by 3, climbing down by 4, climbing up by x. That is equal to 0, and we solve for x, and x is 5 volts. The source is delivering a certain amount of power. How much? Well, according to our video on electric power, the power in any element is V times I. V is 5 volts. I is 6. If that source is delivering 30 watts. How do I know it's delivering and not absorbing? Oh, because the current 6 amps is flowing from low volts to higher volts. An important distinction is necessary to bring up to your attention. A loop represents a trajectory and it goes very often, most of the time, along wires and elements, right? But a Gauss surface is a three-dimensional surface, is most of it out of the drawing, and it's represented in the drawing by its intersection with the plane of the drawing, with a piece of paper or the screen of the computer. Different things. Let's summarize our lecture of tonight. We have introduced KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, as given a Gauss surface, the sum of all the currents entering the Gauss surface is equal to the sum of all the currents leaving the Gauss surface. A Gauss surface is a boundary. It is a three-dimensional surface that surrounds part of a circuit. And then we brought up KVL Kirchhoff's voltage law that said in any loop, if we count climbs as positive voltages and drops as negative ones, the sum of all voltages in that loop. Well, and that is all about KCL and KVL. KCL, KVL, and Ohm's law is all the electrical engineer uses to solve even the most complicated of electronic circuits. However, there is a catch in that statement. In reality, electronic engineers, electrical engineers, they use a workflow that optimizes the use of KCL, KVL, and Ohm's law in such a way that they reduce to a minimum the amount of math work, the math effort necessary to find the solutions to any circuit. We still have ways to go. For now, that is all. Have a good night, my dear invisible friends, and I really hope to meet with you again in our next video.